শুভ সন্ধ্যা বন্ধুরা বরাবরের মতো আজকেও আমরা ডিজিটাল নিউজ 24 এর মাধ্যমে বিশেষ করে বাংলাদেশের সবার জন্য একটি আমাদের যে বর্তমানে পেন্ডেমিক যে অবস্থা চলছে বা আমরা করোনা ভাইরাসের যুগে প্রবেশ করেছি যে সমস্যার মধ্যে দিয়ে যাচ্ছি তার আশু সমাধানের জন্য আমরা কিছু আমরা যারা ফিজিওথেরাপি চিকিৎসকরা আছি তারা চাচ্ছি যে আমাদের শিক্ষা বিশেষ করে এই পেন্ডেমিক সিচুয়েশনে রেসপিরেটরি ফিজিওথেরাপির উপরে আমরা কিছু কি কি কাজ করতে পারি সেই বিষয়ে কিছু জ্ঞান নেওয়ার জন্য এবং আজকে আমাদের সাথে সেই কারণে ভারতের একজন বিখ্যাত ফিজিওথেরাপিস্ট আমাদের সাথে আছেন ডক্টর সামানা সাইদ এবং সবাইকে বলছি যে আমাদের ফিজিও নিউজ 24 এর পক্ষ থেকে সবাইকে শুভেচ্ছা জানাচ্ছি আমি কিছুটা হয়তো বা ইংরেজিতে বলবো কারণ আসলে ফিজিওথেরাপিদের ফিজিওথেরাপি ফিল্ডে ফিজিও নিউজ 24 হচ্ছে আমাদের বাংলাদেশের জন্য প্রথম এবং একটি পূর্ণাঙ্গ ফিজিওথেরাপি বিষয়ক একটি পত্রিকা পাশাপাশি আমরা অনলাইনও কাজ করছি তো আমাদের আজকে আমরা হয়তো বা আমাদের যে এই পত্রিকার যে মেন কর্ণধর ডক্টর শামিম তাকে হয়তো বা আমরা ব্যাক স্টেজে দেখছি কিন্তু বরাবরই উনি আমাদের সাথে থাকবেন এবং পাশে আছেন তো এই জন্যই বলবো যে আজকে আমরা আসলে ফিজিও নিউজ টোয়েন্টি ফোর এর গ্রুপ লিডার শুধু বাংলাদেশের মধ্যেই রাখিনি আজকে আমাদের যে অনুষ্ঠানটা হচ্ছে সেটা বাংলাদেশের কন্ডি পেরিয়েও ইন্ডিয়া এবং পৃথিবীর পাকিস্তান এবং পৃথিবীর বিভিন্ন দেশ থেকে আমাদের প্রায় তিনশো জনের মতো পার্টিসিপেন্ট আমাদের সাথে আজকে আছেন তো আসলে খুব দেরি করতে চাচ্ছি না আমরা খুবই সব আগ্রহ নিয়ে বসে আছি আমাদের ম্যাডাম কিভাবে আসবেন তো আমি আসলে ইংরেজিতে যদি ম্যাডাম একটু ওয়েলকাম জানাই থ্যাংক ইউ ম্যাডাম অ্যান্ড আই উইল ওয়েলকাম ইউ অল স্পেশালি মাই মাই সাইড আই এম ডক্টর শান্তনু বললি ফ্রম বাংলাদেশ অ্যান্ড আই উইল আই উড লাইক টু থ্যাংক ইউ দ্যাটস ইউ হ্যাভ ইউ হ্যাভ গট উই হ্যাভ গট ফ্রম ইউ দ্যাটস what we have requested you before and you have accept, accepted that and uh, especially thanks to uh, you and all participants and today uh, we already we know we have 300 participants with us and almost uh, that is more than half half percent of people are from india so i will thank all indian participant and pakistan participant and all over the world so better i will introduce you that uh, we have uh, you Dr. Samana Saeed with us and she is the Masters in Cardiopulmonary Respiratory Physiotherapy and today she will going to uh, give a beautiful lecture on uh, physiotherapy in COVID-19 situation. So we hope for the best. Thank you, ma'am. You can start now. can you see me yes i can see you now now it's clear yeah okay. audible am i clear yeah uh, before that it's not clear now it's clear so my voice is clear right so yes, hello i'll start once again uh, thank you dr shantanu and dr shamim uh, physio news 24 for uh, inviting me to discuss on one of the uh, most important and the interesting topic you can say which is uh, role of physiotherapy in covid 19 and uh, before that i would also like to thank you for the beautiful introductory video that you have made in the uh, beginning it was like really heart touching you have uh, i actually got nostalgic seeing all those five six years of my achievements that you have just shown in like two three minutes so thank you so much and uh, so before going ahead i am dr samana sayed as he has uh, told you so i won't waste much of the time on introduction and uh, basically i am a, a cardiopulmonary physiotherapist and a pulmonary rehab therapist from uh, mumbai india so uh, without wasting much of your time let us start uh, ahead of the topic i will just start okay i hope my screen is clear okay uh, so our today's topic is on role of physiotherapy as i just told you about covid 19 so now we all know that why we are here the covid 19 disease or you can say uh, corona virus or uh, of course this is something that i won't say that 
uh something i i actually basically uh, don't need to really tell all the physios or all the viewers as well because we all know the stress the panic and the uh, uh whatever you can say the uh, issues that are going worldwide with this disease and if you have see if you are seeing and being updated with the news we have almost 40 million cases globally in the same uh, with the same condition and of course the recovery is also good in many countries and in few countries they are still struggling so for a physiotherapist it is very important to know about this disease because first of all it affects the systems like respiratory musculoskeletal will be we will be learning ahead about all those things which all the physiotherapists who are practicing or who will be doing internship or getting into practice even if you are in your clinical practice also today or tomorrow you will have to encounter such cases and that's the reason it is very very important for each and every physiotherapist whether you are not from a chest background or whether you are uh, not uh, from a background uh, where you where, where you think that you know like uh, like icu or something where you think that you will not be encountering such cases or you have not encountered such cases in the past as well so for all such physiotherapists it is very important to really know the effects and the you uh, the role of physiotherapy like how you can treat patient whenever you see any patient of covid 19 so before starting with the treatment part i will just brush up with the most important basic uh, pathology and how this disease occur and all that just for your knowledge so that you know we are just going in the flow so sorry okay so as i said uh, we are talking about covid 19 so before starting anything i would like to tell you that covid 19 or corona virus is not a new virus there are already uh, it was already uh, invented or you can say it was already discovered in 1930 in domestic poultry and it's a human and animal virus that means it can either occur only in animal or it can go from human to animal as well so there are seven corona viruses that can cause human diseases from which three have already been uh, you can say three are already into, uh, has already affected human being so from that one is sars cov2 which was there in 2002 that is severe acute respiratory syndrome or sars the next one occurred uh, mers cov2 which occurred in 2012 uh, that is middle east respiratory syndrome or mers which mainly occurred in the middle east country that's why the name was kept like this uh, and the last one is sars cov2 that is the current pandemic that we all are facing so just brushing about the basic things is like novel corona virus the name or sars cov2 covid 19 is a name given by world health organization on february 11th for the disease which was caused by novel uh, novel corona virus and since it was uh, in or it, it was discovered in the late uh, or you can say end of uh, 2019 that's why the name given as covid 19 to this disease now in march 2020 the world health organization declared this disease as a pandemic and as i said we have almost 14 million cases now which are uh, so which are, which got infected by this condition and it will keep on it is actually increasing day by day so we cannot really predict when this thing will stop rather we have to really work on ourselves to you know like make ourselves adapted to it and find all the possible ways to prevent it or uh, to treat the patients whichever we can see in all the like all the healthcare professionals basically should or uh, try to find out ways how they can help their patients if they encounter any such condition in a patient or if uh, in their neighborhood so going ahead with covid 19 which is uh, the first thing that you should know uh, is what all symptoms are seen in covid 19 so the typical symptoms of covid 19 i have just generalized it in, uh, in the form of percentages for you uh, in the form of percentage for you uh, that is fever dry cough if you can see the percentage fever is the most common one dry cough fatigue sputum production which is just 33.4% so that's why dry cough is a main symptom of this and you may not find much patients with uh, increased mucus production or secretion in their lungs or sputum production then shortness of breath as the disease uh, progresses definitely the condition affects uh, the uh, lungs get affected in these condition and i will tell you about ahead about it in detail so that you know you can understand as you will go ahead you will start understanding the topic more for sure then myalgia and arth or arthralgia generalized uh, body pain joint pain 
sore throat which is just 13% uh, if you all have read in the uh, when that when this disease uh, started in february and march like suddenly when it started spreading uh, it was said that fever and sore throat were the primary symptoms of that but basically now if you can see only 13% of the population showed this then headache chills nausea or vomiting nasal congestion diarrhea hemoptysis conjunctival congestion so these are the symptoms just uh, percentage wise what you can see in these patients but for uh, physiotherapists or for healthcare professionals we have divided into uh, or you can say we have subdivided into a uh, common less common and serious symptoms so that you understand and it becomes easier for you to understand whenever you see any such kind of patient so again going back to this the most common symptoms are as i said before that is fever dry cough tiredness now less common symptoms uh, the the symptoms that fall uh, that fall in the category of less common symptoms are joint pain aches sore throat diarrhea conjunctivitis headache loss of taste or smell now recently since i am from india and i am from mumbai now recently we have started encountering a lot of patients who are complaining about loss of taste or smell uh, and slight breathlessness and they are uh, they are usually quarantined and they get better with that it's slight fever loss of taste so it this symptom uh, is actually gradually uh, increasing in population but yes only in mild and moderate cases for now and of course as your disease progresses uh, a person encounters all the other symptoms as well a rash on skin or discoloration of finger or toes now there is something which uh, in the initial stages of this pandemic when uh, people started uh, researching more about the disease and everything there was something which was uh, uh, which came uh, to our knowledge uh, which was called as covid toes and it was basically found in Uh, children or peds so uh, initial stage like initially when the disease and the virus was mutating uh, so, uh, doctors started found, uh, find uh, started finding out that uh, the kids basically started getting rashes on their skin and which was more prominent on the toe region and that's why it was known as covid toe but basically it was treatable and it didn't do much harm you can say the virus didn't do much harm with the kids and it was very much treatable and the recovery rate was very much uh, better or you can say good now when we talk about serious symptoms this happens when your patient start uh, uh, progressing like when the disease starts progressing and that's the time when you start getting symptoms like difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath chest pain or uh, pleuritic chest pain loss of speech or movement dysphonia and dysphagia that is difficulty in articulation difficulty in swallowing difficulty in speaking so all these symptoms start happening when the patient starts progressing in the disease so now going ahead with the symptom we really need to know what is a disease severity now why knowing disease severity is important because being a physiotherapist you may encounter patients at different stages of diseases not only just in icu uh, you may have you may encounter conditions or uh, patients with, uh, who may just have a mild infection or uh, patients who are asymptomatic or the patients who are going into moderate uh, severe uh, illness so it is important to uh, for you to know like the percentage at which this disease severity occurs so if you will see 80% of the cases are either mild or asymptomatic uh, as per the current report uh, usually the recurrent of uh, like the uh, from an asymptomatic infection the spread is not that severe and it's lower as compared to other stages of the disease then you have severe viral pneumonia with oxygen support that is 15% critical cases of respiratory failure requiring ventilation and life support 5% and death occurs in 5% of cases when the disease progresses and the patient is unable to cope up with it so going ahead we need to know that we are from the start of the disease we are following who recommendation for all the kind of treatment and quarantine and all other uh, things related to covid-19 so as per who recommendation people with mild symptoms who are otherwise healthy should manage the symptoms at home 
and on average it takes four to six days from when someone is infected with the virus for the symptoms to show however it can take 14 days so this is something i think i'm sure you all must be knowing that's the reason uh, 14 days of quarantine is very much necessary if you are traveling or if you're in the uh, traveling from the zone which was affected from covid 19 or you're coming in contact with covid 19 cases uh, so 14 days of quarantine makes sense for this reason now the most important thing as i would say you should know is uh, or you can say are the risk factors of this condition now why we need to know the risk factors the first reason i would say rather than going for the treatment part or uh, teaching your patients to actually you know like or uh, thinking about the treatment part and everything is to prevent your patients or to prevent the population so if you know that you have any patient of yours or you know any family member or any of your friends who fall under this risk factor category you can immediately try to explain them the uh, the danger of uh, getting infected by covid-19 and how their body will respond less as compared to other healthy individual and why social distancing and trying to take all the precautions wearing mask is important for such kind of cases so for this reason you should know what are the risk factors of the disease i hope i'm clear and if you want me to slow down you can tell me any time okay uh, so yes so as i said going ahead with the risk factors older age greater than 65 years is definitely one of the main uh, risk factor of this condition moderate to severe asthma lung disease high blood pressure heart disease diabetes liver disease kidney failure or renal failure severe obesity okay bmi of 40 and higher is also under risk factor or someone who has a weakened immune system are more likely to get this condition which includes smokers okay so it's there is something you should actually start educating your patients as well or your friends your family members that smokers are also under the risk factor so it is very important for them to stop it now people being treated for cancer people who have had a uh, bone marrow transplant people who have hiv aids or any kind of immunocompromised condition wherever the immunity gets affected in the cases like steroids or anything all these conditions fall under risk factors so when you are treating any patient who gets any of who are coming under these risk factor the treatment approach will differ as that when it happens to a healthy covid case like of a very simple example if a patient has got asthma or the patient is a smoker or was already having copd any obstructive condition and that patient is getting covid 19 then the treatment approach will slightly differ as compared to a person who is no healthy and the person who has got pneumonia or any other complications that occurs in covid 19 who is not having any kind of this underlying disease i hope i am clear with this okay so now uh, as going ahead with this thing uh, now what we saw were the risk factors of this condition now we come to the complications now complications are the most important thing to be known because now knowing the complications can only help you to actually design your own protocol as a physiotherapist and these complications will actually if you have a good knowledge of this complication then you can actually decide what kind of treatment should be given at what stages to your uh, patients so the commonest complication as we can see here is severe pneumonia now this is a common one you all know it, this disease started with a pneumonia in wuhan china and then that's how this is the most severe complication which we uh, uh, which is pneumonia now other complications include so basically as the disease progresses okay now someone has got mild infection uh, so what i can say is it's better that if you can listen because i will speak more than what i will show you on the slides so if you can listen to me that will be more helpful so basically let us take an example if someone got just affected with covid 19 and the person has got a mild infection so when we talk about mild infection usually it can be just a normal uh, dry cough or upper respiratory uh, uh, tract infection 
now if the person is getting better getting recovered from that only then that person will get recovered from that upper respiratory tract infection only and the normal recovery goes ahead in that scenario even you don't even need any kind of physiotherapy treatment it's very much manageable normal breathing exercises are usually helpful for such cases now if the disease is progressing if the disease uh, progresses ahead other complications can come into picture like if the pneumonia that is severe pneumonia so basically from mild the patient is going to moderate and then the patient is going into a severe infection and that's why it is very important for you to know all these stages so that you can decide your treatment protocol for all these different stages for your patient so as i said now suppose from uh, the mild condition the uh, the virus starts uh, multiplying and the virus is uh, causing more and more of alveolar damage and everything then it leads to pneumonia and as the pneumonia progresses as a secondary complication the patient gets acute respiratory distress syndrome and then as the disease progresses other things that you can see below are usually uh, uh, something uh, are the symptoms uh, are the complications sorry that you can see in such kind of cases that is sepsis or septic shock following ards multiple organ injury or or organ failure including acute cardiac uh, kidney injury liver dysfunction and cardiac injury or hemorrhagic posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome as a manifestation of covid-19 infection even in some cases they have seen they have a stroke is also been seen now as i said reversible encephalopathy if you can see it about that is also one one of the reason this is usually found in cases who are ventilated and this is again one of the reason Uh, why uh, you can say the cognitive issues or uh, uh, the cognitive deterioration is found found in the cases of covid-19 so it is one of the reason i won't say it is one of the main reason which leads to cognitive issues in uh, covid-19 cases but yes so this is something important for you to know whatever the complications are now just going ahead quickly i'll explain you pathophysiology uh, very shortly uh, uh, like uh, very briefly because uh, so that you know what you are actually dealing with and how it goes ahead so basically what happens is when the covid uh, virus the when the virus attacks your lung or attacks our lung uh, the first thing uh, we do have is two uh, receptors in our alveoli and what happens is this virus has got some affinity to attraction though we do have it in other organs of our body as well but this virus has got some affinity towards the ace2 receptors in our alveoli of the lungs and it attacks the alveoli of the lung so now what happens when it goes inside the lung it gets uh, multiplied and encapsulated within the alveoli which leads to pneumonia and just as a defense your body starts producing cytokine and uh, chemokine to actually prevent the uh, prevent the multiplication or you know to prevent the inflammation and all other as a defense to protect your body and that leads to immune cell activation now what happens the only drawback in this thing is the cytokine and cyto uh, and chemokine release in these cases is a uh, huge so usually if you can see here this is called as storm syndrome so what happens in there is a cytokine storm that gets produced inside your lungs which leads to more alveolar damage so if the person's immunity is good and that's one of the reason why we keep on saying that you know like why 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 people should work on their immunity you must have heard about it that we keep on telling that you know patients should work on immunity and all that so if your body's immune cell activation is able to manage this then your body goes into resolution and if not if the body goes in the lung goes into further damage and that leads to ards acute uh, lung injury kidney kidney injury and a lot of other issues so if you can see the phases over here the phase 1 when the uh, when the virus attacks your body is epithelial cell infection which leads to acute inflammation and if that can resolve, get resolved with the immune cell activation then either it can go to resolution or otherwise your disease severity will increase and that can lead to other issues like ards kidney shock uh, kidney failure multi organ failure uh, or death so i hope uh, this is clear i just want to know am i clear uh, i hope you all are able to you know you can just yeah okay yes going, okay ma'am yeah if i am going too fast or something you can tell me i can slow down in between okay So just for example, I will just show you some X-rays, like two, three X-rays, uh, to show what happens to your lungs. Now, the, as I said, COVID nineteen affects our pri uh, primarily our respiratory system, and then it starts 
progressing ahead which leads to a lower respiratory tract infection pneumonia and that aggr aggravates ahead and leads to ARDS so this is just an example of uh, a uh, chest x-ray or uh, you can say where you can see this is COVID-19 pneumonia. So basically the peculiar characteristic of COVID-19 pneumonia is it starts from the lower lobes and in most of the cases it is bilateral pneumonia and the consolidation is usually it starts as in the form of ground glass opacities and then ahead as the disease progresses you can see a proper consol uh, consolidative patches of pneumonia in this now as the disease progresses if you can see this is more over here the patch of the consolidation and the involvement of the lung now as the disease progresses the alveolar damage increases in all the other areas of the lung and that can lead to ARDS that is respiratory failure so basically in these conditions or you can see in COVID-19 is a secondary complication of uh, pneumonia. So if you can see the damage done in the lungs is from this to the ARDS that is a severe case where the patient really needs ventilation or the patient gets ventilated and uh, is on high FiO2. So I hope it's clear to them. This is just to show you the example. Now oh, you all know there's just a, rev a revision kind of thing for you all that uh, the, uh, the test you that uh, the uh, the basic te diagnostic test for um, COVID-19 is RT polymerase cha uh, chain reaction which can be taken either by nasopharyngeal or throat swabs and x-ray and CT scan are also taken for this condition but chest CT scan is usually more valid in order to know the severity of the disease, uh, disease or uh, the extent of lung damage. So now, uh, how will you know that your COVID-19 infection starts or is starting to cause pneumonia? That means it is progressing in disease. So if you see any of these symptoms in your patient, then you should know that the disease is progressing. That is rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath or breathlessness, rapid breathing, dizziness, sorry, heavy sweating, no wheezing and dry cough. So if you will see, I, we, I am just showing you dry cough in most of the places. Uh, basically, if uh, the sputum production is very much uh, less and rare in COVID-19 condition. Basically, it's more in the conditions uh, where the patient is having any underlying disease or lung disease, which can lead to hypersecretion or mucus production. So now why I'm telling this again and again that you will come to know when we'll start uh, uh, discussing about the treatment of it. So 15% of COVID-19 cases, only 15% are severe who are hospitalized and they may need high flow nasal oxygen. 5% of cases have critical infection and need a ventilator. Now uh, people who get pneumonia may also have a condition called ARDS as we have discussed ahead and that leads to a more, like that leads to more and more breathing problems so basically if you go back to the pathophysiology uh, because of the alveolar damage the virus affecting your lungs and then the virus affecting the uh, alveoli uh, of your lung and then it progressing not able to uh, inflaming uh, leading to inflammation to your entire alveolar uh, your alveoli of lung and every all those things basically leads to breathlessness hypoxemia and that's the reason uh, that's just it justifies why the patient needs a uh, high flow nasal oxygen or ventilator so just for your example this is like a high flow nasal oxygen that is given to patients uh, now we have discussed about the basic complications if you can see we'll just revise it for your uh, this thing like common complication that is severe pneumonia and what it can lead ahead if the disease uh, progresses like ARDS, organ failure and all that. Now, other than that, what you all should remember is the uh, following complications which can also occur in COVID-19 cases. And again, as I said, these complications help you to decide and plan your treatment protocol for such kind of cases. So the first one is ICU acquired weakness or post incentive care syndrome. Now, uh, what happens is uh, in any kind of uh, case, like any kind of patient who is getting admitted in the ICU and uh, uh, being on ventilator or is bedridden for longer duration, this kind of uh, syndrome is very much common in any case other than COVID-19 also, if any case who is on ventilator bedridden for prolonged duration, 
this kind of syndrome is very much common in those cases now what it is exactly icu acquired weakness is basically the generalized weakness of the muscles of your upper limb your lower limb and the, you can say the bigger muscle starts from the bigger muscles of your body which we use the most so what happens is it starts uh, le it leads to myopathy of these muscles so basically if you must have seen icu cases in the past okay we all have seen it uh, ignore covid 19 for like some time let us just talk more about that so if you have seen icu cases in that we usually give general mobility exercises passive movements passive uh, upper limb and lower limb movements to the patients who are admitted in icu or who are bedridden for a longer duration because that is also a part to prevent contractures or the part to prevent uh, the uh, like you know muscle uh, because the muscle is unused so that is one reason the other reason if you have when you have any kind of respiratory issue or whenever you have any kind of uh, oxygen imbalance in your body hypoxia or hypoxemia like how you get that in a covid 19 case any kind of such issues leads to a decreased uh, you can say uh, you can say a uh, a trophy in muscles of uh, your limb so what happens is basically in a very simple term ignore what uh, just ignore what is written over there Where, suppose suppose okay it's a, it's in a layman term i'm not uh, using any technical term just to make you understand so if there is any kind of oxygen imbalance in your body your lung needs oxygen to survive the patient is on ventilator S simultaneously the body like your entire body your muscles your organs they also require oxygen to survive now what happens is your lung wants oxygen the muscles of your body needs oxygen so there is some fight that goes inside your body and usually what happens the lung wins and it starts taking oxygen from all the bigger muscles of your body and that's why myopathy or polyneuropathy atrophy all these occurs in icu acquired uh, syndrome and that is the reason just not the chest but you have to really take care of the uh, lower uh, the muscular part or the muscular component of the cases who are admitted in icu now other than that there is something called as post viral fatigue syndrome that is also seen in a lot of covid 19 cases which can be uh, actually observed after 3 months or 4 months of recovery so this happens usually in the cases who are not responding well to the treatment for 3 to 4 months and if you find any kind of such syndrome in the patient then you have to stop this uh, you have to stop your treatment because that can actually Uh, increase the cardiovascular uh, compromise in the case so that is again one thing that you need to really understand while treating or giving rehabilitation to any kind of patient then delirium confusion if the patient is going into a severe covid 19 condition of course there will be hypoxia that is reduced oxygenation hypoxemia and if the patient is going into any kind of encephalopathy encephalitis or any other thing that can also lead to delirium confusion men no mental steadiness anxiety depression in these cases now the reason of anxiety and depression is just not prolonged uh, bed uh, be being prolonged uh, ventilated or bedridden now uh, basically see to be like very uh, to be very true and frank with all of you covid 19 is something that we all are experiencing okay there is a lot of panic there is a lot of stress in this and trust me whoever comes positive goes into a severe anxiety and panic as soon as the disease occurs so now when that patient goes into more and more of uh, severity like the progression in the disease occurs and then that patient is hospitalized on ventilator no is no one is coming to see that patient and then after so many days usually the process is for 22 days or one month the patient is usually uh, hospitalized in the case for 3 to 4 uh, uh, with the severity of the disease for 3 to 4 weeks in the hospital in such cases usually the patient when he wakes up he starts trying when he starts gaining his uh, consciousness such kind of patient you will see will be more into depression anxiety because of this disease okay this disease doesn't just affect you uh, physically or your doesn't just affect your uh, you can say respiration respiratory system it affects your entire psychosocial uh, system as well your cognitive system as well so these are one of the complications that you used to know when you are seeing any kind of patient because when you are treating a patient you will have to consider that this patient cannot be uh, mentally stable or steady to actually follow all your commands so that's how you will have to guide your patient or you can say counsel your patient so that you are going on a right path of treatment
Now, prolonged ventilation can also lead to dysphonia and dysphagia, uh, which can be, again, uh, which is something that you will have to consider while giving treatment to such kind of cases. I hope I'm clear till here. So till now, what we did is we just tried to understand the complications and how this works and how uh, how you have to like what are the basic complications and everything that you have to take care and go ahead with it while seeing any kind of such cases. Now, going ahead with uh, uh, the role of physiotherapy, before starting and going ahead, the thing that I would like you all to understand is that WHO recommends minimal staff. So... What does this mean? So if you will see when this disease started around in Feb or March, uh, the first paper which was released by WHO in terms of uh, physiotherapy role was basically something like this. So I have quoted the uh, main uh, sentence from that, that acutely unwell confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patients should not be routinely referred to physiotherapy. So basically, uh, most of the cases and most of the patients who, who are being ventilated out of ARDS and they don't have a lot of secretions. So that's why a physiotherapy should actually enter for their role only when it is needed. Like suppose if a patient is having any underlying disease or if the patient is having any mucus secretion or cough, uh, sorry, or any kind of uh, hyper secretion, that is the time when the physiotherapy uh, intervention can be given to that cases. That also you have to be very particular because you cannot uh, give, uh, uh, like you have to be, there are a lot of contraindications while giving any kind of chest physiotherapy to any uh, ARDS case because uh, you have to manage it with the positive and expiratory pressure or the PEEP the patient is on. So that is one thing. Other than that, the patient can be Usually, uh, what physiotherapist can do is, as per, I'm just quoting the WHO uh, sent, uh, statement, that is, they can help either in positioning or for the long-term benefits or rehabilitation of COVID-19 patients who have not returned to their functional baseline once they are not acutely unwell. So this was something from which we started designing our protocol and designing our treatment plan and everything. So this is just the, to give the basic idea like how the physiotherapy treatment started when uh, this COVID-19 uh, started spreading and when physios came into uh, form and physios came into position to actually start treating the patient. And you won't believe it now, physiotherapist plays a very important role in actually rehabilitating a COVID-19 case, especially when the case is hospitalized or when the patient is uh, in ICU or just recovered from ICU, weaned out of ventilator. The rehabilitation part is, a the, you can say, includes a more, in, uh, like an integral part, you can say. Physiotherapists are an integral part of this kind of uh, rehabilitation. So going ahead with this is, Minimal staff, as I said, so wherever required, there only physiotherapists should actually go ahead for the treatment part because we need to try to uh, reduce the staff uh, for a patient. And uh, that is basically for prevention control and to prevent the spread of the disease since it is a highly contagious virus. Now, other than that, proper PPE, that is protective uh, equipment, of course, that is something without that you are not supposed to see any active case. Your health is your responsibility and you have to take care of that as a physiotherapist. So just, I want to uh, go much in detail of that because I'm sure a lot of you are already using PPE. So basically all you need to know is what all is, what all are the parts that you have to be careful of when you are wearing a PPE. That is your foot cover, your gloves, your uh, N95 mask. Usually we use N95 mask, your face shield, visor. So. Two things that you have to take care of while using PPE is just donning and doffing. Donning is how to put it and doffing is how to remove it. So there are just steps which were given by um, uh, WHO that you have to follow while performing donning and doffing of PPE. So just uh, uh, quickly, we can just see the steps that is perform hand hygiene, put on shoe cover first, then gown, then mask, then you have to put eye protection and then you have to put on gloves. Similarly, now when you have to remove this, you remove your shoe cover, remove your gown and gloves together, perform hand hygiene, remove eye protection, 
remove mask and perform hand hygiene so this is these are the few steps that you have to follow and this is how you are supposed to do it so that you don't lead to any further infection or self infection after seeing any kind of a covid 19 case now close suctioning wherever possible wherever you require suctioning uh, usually it is done by sister in charge so physiotherapists don't have to worry much about it but wherever whenever suctioning is required you can opt for close suctioning so that there is no aerosol or, or droplet infection uh, occurring because of this uh, this kind of condition so basically avoid aerosol generating procedures now i'll show you tell you ahead we'll go ahead in the slides and we'll see what it is exactly cuff etiquettes for both staff and patient so if you are seeing a case who has got any kind of secretion it is very important that not only the physiotherapist but the uh, but the staff, patient should also be following some basic cuff etiquettes or manner or some basic principles like if the patient wants to cough out if you are giving any kind of treatment where the where you are teaching huffing uh, huffing or coughing to the patient you have to make that patient wear the mask while doing any kind of such forced expiratory technique in order to prevent any kind of uh, spread of the infection so other than that the most important thing uh, Uh, which is coming ahead is positioning now as i said uh, talking about the ic i think we can just see this before that that would be better as i said aerosol generating procedure before going ahead so these were the uh, international papers that, that this is from the international paper which was released in the initial stages of the disease where they have asked to avoid all these procedure which are mentioned over here because these are included into aerosol gen, uh, generating procedures so which includes cuff generating procedure like huff and also wherever required only over there with the proper mask and proper infection prevention control uh, keeping all the principles under your mind then only you can give that where it is not needed you don't really need to do that positioning gravity assisted drainage techniques manual techniques like percussion vibration uh, that can trigger a cuff can also be uh, should also be avoided wherever needed like it is again individual based now use of ppe any devices pep oscillating pep bubble pep or uh, nasopharyngeal suctioning manual hyperinflation open suction any mobilization therapy sputum induction anything that can lead to any kind of cough or expectoration expectoration of mucus were, are supposed to be avoided and then the physiotherapist should weigh up the risk versus the benefit of completing these in intervention so that was was mentioned if you can see at the end that physiotherapist has to be very much calculative while deciding any kind of such treatment or while deciding any kind of treatment for their covid patient just by knowing what will benefit the patient more and what will uh, what will be something that can be avoided or that can be replaced by any other technique that can prevent even the physios and all other staff from any kind of spread of infection so here in any kind of covid 19 case physiotherapist have to be really smart and they should have a good logical reasoning before starting any kind of treatment for such kind of cases now going ahead with this these two things are very important and you must have heard it everywhere that is prone positioning and early mobilization so as because the patient goes into ARDS and also the pneumonia which occurs in covid 19 is usually a lower lobe pneumonia and lower lobes are affected more which gets aggravated and severe and leads to ARDS prone positioning plays a very important part in these kind of conditions so basically prone positioning uh, the effects of prone positioning of uh, respiratory failure or respiratory distress was uh, actually invented by italian population only years back and then when this disease hit, started hitting their country they started using this for their patients and that gave amazing results and that's the reason how it is very much and highly followed by all kind of cases and it's giving amazing results for the patients now if you would see in the past for non non covid cases or the patients who were having ARDS usually prone positioning was recommended for cases or who uh when unconscious because you know it is very difficult to actually uh, position a patient prone who is conscious you know like imagine you i ask you to be in prone position like for 4 hours or 3 hours i mean it's very difficult like, i can't be that like for that long but still now in covid 19 cases even the conscious patients are made for uh, made to be prone and prone ventilation is given to those patients and it it is basically given to 
prevent any kind of progression of the disease and definitely to improve the condition of the patient who are getting affected by pneumonia or progressing to ARDS. So prone positioning plays a very important role and why it is important I can just uh, we can just discuss about that as well. And then early mobilization uh, we will talk about it ahead. So as I said prone positioning is basically why why uh, prone positioning is uh, promoted so much in case of ARDS is so a basic thing uh, like just imagine your lungs so if you have heard of uh, ventilation and perfusion ratio so if you know that the upper and the anterior part of your lung is good in ventilation and basically the posterior and the lower part of your lung is good in ventilation the Q part so basically what happens whenever you get ARDS and when you prone the patient because the lower lobe is more focused on the backward side of your body very simple I'm just making it more simpler so when the patient is prone see if you don't understand this at the end I can explain you without the slides and all with some uh, demo or something if you don't understand if you understand then, it, then it's well and good uh, so what happens is when you make the patient lie down prone okay if you can see over here this is just an example of COVID-19 case only who have been given prone positioning so when you make the patient lie down prone if you can see here so the lower part of the lungs are usually exposed and that is the reason the ventilation is more in the lower part of the lungs and that's what we want right because we have to improve the ventilation in the lower zone because lower zones are the uh, are the zones which are affected more also since the perfusion is already good in this zone that's why ventilation and perfusion mismatch is improved and therefore it is uh, it leads to proper ventilation also the load of the heart over the heart in this position is reduced and that's why this position helps a lot in improving any kind of uh, ARDS or, or helps in progression of the patient and also reduces hypoxia or hypoxemia in these cases usually in ICU up to 12 hours of prone positioning is suggested but again it is very much patient dependent so you should know how to do it this is just uh, this is for your uh, reference like how you can prone position your patient uh, which you should just uh, uh, like you can understand with this uh, the ankle if you can see it should be semi dorsiflexed and a pillow should always be kept below the uh, uh, shin so that the patient is very much comfortable right shoulder semi internally rotated both shoulders slightly elevated neck slightly flexed semi-rotated head and space for the tracheal tube now if you can see the pillow placement this is all done because all you have to do when you are seeing any kind of patient in ICU for chest physiotherapy of COVID-19 is to reduce the work of breathing and not to do any manure that can lead to increased work of breathing and that's what we have to focus while giving any treatment or any uh, any kind of treatment protocol for these kind of patients so again going back ahead so i hope uh, you are clear with prone positioning part any doubts you can ask me at the end but this is very important because you need to really know and this you can give not only to the patient who are in icu once a patient is recovered you have to still continue giving the prone breathing exercises prone positioning everything to your patients now going ahead is early mobilization as I said so once your patient is better if you think now these are the two things which is mentioned as per the international papers should be given by physiotherapist in the ICU is if the patient is having any kind of respiratory issues which can lead to mucus hypersecretion or difficulty in clearing secretions then you can give any kind of bronchial hygiene manure or any kind of uh, uh, chest clearance technique or uh, exercises whatever is required by the patient to help and solve the issue if not then basically there is no use of giving any kind of chest physiotherapy manual secondly start mobilization early mobilization even in active cases is very much uh, advised in COVID-19 cases so even if the patient is on ventilator you can start with the propped up positioning and then gradually as the patient goes ahead early mobilization plays a very important role so you should know when you have to give early mobilization to these patients that is when the patient is uh, able to obey the command not on inotropic uh, support or no arrhythmia or ischemia, uh, ischemia in past 24 hours respiration FiO2 is less than 50 percent PEEP that is positive and expiratory pressure is less than eight usually it goes up to 10 in such kind of cases 
muscle power when you have to progress the mobilization should be at least uh, ul and ll that is upper limb and lower limb greater than three and blood or biochemistry reports should be within the normal range so you have to be very calculative when you are giving any kind of mobilization to the patients who are in icu and gradually then you can increase it as per the uh, condition of the patient now just contraindications to pp that is prone positioning absolute if your patient is having any of these then you are not supposed to give prone positioning to the patient any open uh, abdominal wounds multiple trauma pregnancy severe hemodynamic instability high dependency on airway vascular access spine instability unmonitored increased intracranial pressure etc see basically uh just not prone positioning but also you have to give other kind of like side lying and propped up position as you can see over here to your patients as for the patient's need if and also these things can be taught to the patient for home activity or home exercise program because positioning is very much important for treating any kind of respiratory ailment so now as i said uh basically uh what what we are doing today is basically just the overview of this condition so because of the time limitation to be very true i cannot exactly teach you everything in detail but usually when i take covid workshop which goes up to 4 hours in that we try to do each and everything from the assessment from the treatment so whatever i can cover up as an overview i'll try to understand so uh, i'll try to explain you so that you get a brief idea of what you have to do when you are giving any kind of uh, treatment to such patients now going ahead so i hope you are clear till now like for the severe case what you are supposed to do now once your patient is getting better going to the rehabilitation part what you have to do is before going into rehabilitation part three things that you need to understand is that these are the main systems where you have to work on these kind of patients that is respiratory or cardiac because cardiac involvement is also found in such cases uh, the virus can also affect your respiratory system and then it can lead to even cardiac uh, pulmonary sorry pulmonary embolism as well so even cardiac condition can be seen but there is not much that you can do so basically respiratory is the more important part that you have to follow the neuromuscular aspect because of course as i told you that because of hypoxia hypoxemia icu syndrome a lot of other issues prolonged bed uh, ridden uh, mobilization patient will be having a neuromotor uh, aspect or neuromotor involvement so being a, when you, whenever you try to give rehabilitation to such cases you have to take care of these aspects as well then cognitive and psychosocial aspect we have discussed about it before so you have you need to really understand that these are the things that you have to consider when you are treating any kind of covid-19 cases so from the international papers these things you should consider for giving any kind of rehabilitation to your patient that is impaired lung function physical deconditioning muscle weakness delirium or cognitive impairments impaired sw uh, swallow and communication that is dysphonia and dysphagia we spoke about it mental health support and psychosocial support needs now what you need to understand is you know like there is a difference in treating all kind of respiratory conditions you cannot treat all kind of respiratory diseases in the same pattern every lung disease has got a different way of treatment so this treatment usually of covid-19 falls into interstitial lung disease that is you can say restrictive lung disease so what happens is when the person goes gets pneumonia and when the the patient gets ARDS and as the progression increases basically the lung shows a pattern of interstitial lung disease so your entire treatment should follow that protocol basically whenever you are trying to treat this kind of condition so basically i cannot exactly teach you in the depth about it but yeah for your uh, like overview you can understand that that's how you have to decide your treatment for an obstructive disease or a pleural disease or you can say a restrictive disease the treatment or a physiotherapy uh, aspect of it uh, the protocol is quite different and you cannot give one kind of treatment to the other kind of disease because they both are basically very much opposing or you can say different in pathology so for this interstitial thing is something that you need to consider i hope i'm clear so going ahead this is just for the assessment part since we are running short of time now uh, so if you it is very important for you to know that you know the assessment part is also important when you are seeing any kind of respiratory condition ahead in future so just 
quickly going through this impairments like you can you can uh, see patient uh, who may have a lung uh, like this is how you can actually measure the limitations or impairment in the covid 19 condition lung function spirometry respiratory muscle strength pft pulmonary function test you can diagnose it outcome measure can be seen through that limb muscle strength either you can check it through mmt or handle dynamometer exercise capacity that is 6 minute walk test and there are other tests also that i teach usually and it takes a lot of time so we can just uh, quickly go over these things gait speed that is 4 meter walk test balance can be tested by uh, berg's balance scale then you can even give a different uh, um uh, quality of life and cognitive issues uh, assessment to your patients to actually check the assessment now just uh, briefing about the treatment part again going ahead see assessment is very important for the rehabilitation part because that's how you will understand what is the improvement in your case and being a physio you will be seeing patient in various stages so you have to be very much decisive now in icu this cannot be really done but as a patient is weaning off coming out of the icu or discharged or coming to you for pulmonary rehabilitation all these things are very 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 important now basically to be very true this the the entire rehabilitation that i am teaching you is basically nothing but just pulmonary rehabilitation that we teach to our patients so to be very true whatever we whatever i am teaching you is no rocket science for a person who is actually practicing pulmonary rehabilitation since ages like i am practicing it for over a decade so that's why pulmonary rehabilitation you already include a lot of these stuff and that's why uh, knowing uh, about the chest physio part or chest physio aspect is very important for you uh, whenever you are seeing any kind of covid 19 case so going ahead now as i said first acute we decided uh, we already discussed for acute cases proning respiratory pt not to increase the work of breathing so that is if, if the secretion is present then only you need to really work on chest physiotherapy maneuvers for drainage of secretion and all that or the respiratory exercises which ever are required for the patient or the facilitation exercises to actually help the patient to breathe when the patient is on ventilator or weaning out of the ventilator there are a lot of techniques that you can do in that as well as a physiotherapist and they are huge they are more into practical aspect and we have limited uh, limitations in uh, our timing so i cannot go into that but yes the main thing that you have to focus on is that you are not supposed to increase the work of breathing of your patient right and early mobilization be very calculative be very decisive you should know when to actually improve the uh, when to start mobilizing your patient you can just start it from making your patient sitting upright and then at the edge of the bed standing and gradually you can progress as per the vitals so whenever you see any patient in the icu as a physiotherapist your one eyeball should be at the patient and other eyeball should be at the monitor and that is what is very important so you have to really take all your steps and uh, keeping in your mind or keeping in consideration the exact vitals that is or the changes in the vital that is occurring in your patient now subacute or long term cases what you have to work on is for the patient who uh, as you can see the rehabilitation part is respiratory muscle strength skeletal muscle strength of course the respiration uh, the respiratory aspect is affected so that is again an entire rehab program that you have to give it for that skeletal muscle strength you have to work on the muscles of the of the skeletal muscles which are affected now you have to uh, continue the progression of your treatment in such a way that the patient's aerobic capacity is increased and also because of a lot of undergoing issues prolonged immobilization prolonged ventilation hypoxia hypoxemia then imbalanced in the or you can say myopathy polyneuropathy all that things that are occurring in a patient in icu the gait and balance are also affected in this kind of cases and that's why in rehabilitation you have to really focus on these things as well other than that cognitive and psychosocial component is also very important as i have discussed it before now um uh, other thing that uh, you need to understand in this is uh, as i said now it is just not that the patient will come to you immediately for rehabilitation after uh, getting discharged from the hospital the patient may come to you after two months with any other muscular ailment as well now you need to understand that one thing being a respiratory physiotherapist that i'll share is that any condition which has a uh, lung involvement can lead to skeletal muscle uh, you can say weakness right and what happens is 
a person in covid-19 this is more severe as compared to other lung disease so if a patient who is having a covid-19 condition and a patient who is not having a lung issue uh, or non covid lung issue will show reduced strength and endurance as compared to non covid case so the strength its endurance is highly highly affected in such kind of cases and it is very very important for you to work on strength and endurance of those cases and you have to be so patient as a physiotherapist you cannot just rush up with the treatment because they will not be as cooperative as the patient who are uh, uh, who are having uh, you can say who is having pneumonia uh, with a non covid condition so that is something you really need to understand because you will and along with that okay like of course the strength and endurance is reduced along with that the cognitive and uh, psychosocial component the dementia anxiety all those things delirium amnesia even uh, memory loss all these things also occurs in post icu cases and then you know it becomes really difficult for a physiotherapist to uh, to work on these patients so you have to be very very patient and logical while treating such cases now just a little bit of brief on this respiratory intervention so as i said of uh, what is the role of a physiotherapist when seeing the respiratory part of rehabilitation that is progressive weaning from oxygen support now if your patient is progressively weaning and if you once a patient is out of uh, ventilator and if you think that patient has got any kind of secretions or anything you can always teach acbt that is active cycle of breathing technique where the patient can learn to remove their own secretions and it will be more helpful for them just for just for the reason uh that this condition is highly contagious otherwise if not then you can always go for the other uh, maneuvers for uh, removing the uh, chest secretions of your patient usually if the patient is not having any kind of cough or secretion and if the patient is out of ventilator then active cycle of breathing technique uh, shouldn't be that uh, uh, advisable for such cases rather you can just work on increasing or improving the lung volumes of the patients with various different exercises like uh, basic diaphragmatic breathing and other breathing breath hold techniques and a lot of other techniques there are that are there Uh, if i get time i will teach you few of them but uh, other than that respiratory muscle training as i said that comes in the later stages alveolar recruitment strategies airway clearance techniques wherever needed so as we discussed about this whenever it is required you can start with acbt or uh, exercises breath hold combined with positioning for the treatment of the patient now coming to the neuromotor uh, intervention reconditioning and resistance training strength and balance training stretching and flexibility training neuromuscular electrical stimulation can also be given to the patient who are having any kind of neuropathy or weakness because that also helps to improve the overall uh, hypoxemia of the patient and a lot of studies have been even shown that other than that cognitive aspect a good lung needs a good brain to be treated so if you think that you can just work on your patient without working on the cognitive aspect of a patient then you are wrong and you won't be able to get the desired result so that is very important for you to really focus on all the aspects of the treatment a holistic approach is very much important whenever you are seeing a covid-19 case because you need to really understand the main fact that this is not an airway disease even after we keep on saying a lot about chest physiotherapy and everything this is not an airway disease it is has it has not been uh, categorized into a respiratory disease as well so it can affect different and various systems of your body and that's why you need to really be very much calculative and decisive in any kind of approach that you are uh, using for your cases now other than that psychological support mental relaxation breathing exercises for anxiety meditation nutritional counseling good sleep all these things are also important and for dysphonia and dysphagia you can anytime show it to a speech therapist you can include speech therapist inside your uh, treat team and then you can uh, or a nutritional counselor and then you can really work on these things now since we are uh, running short of time this is my youtube channel physiolab by dr samana where you can find the exercises to manage stress and anxiety in covid 19 and even the best breathing exercises for covid 19 which you can give to normal uh, individuals as well and even with the recovering cases as well and for the patient who are in mild and moderate conditions as well okay so basically uh what we have done is this is just the overview now what is more important for you to understand is that uh 
first thing as i said this was just the overview part because we have really i have tried to explain you that being a physiotherapist how you need to really work on the proper uh, protocol or uh, how you have to uh, start logically reasoning the type of uh, about the protocol that you have to set for your patients so you have to understand that being a physiotherapist you will see cases in all these different units that is either in I in icu so now you need to know that what all can be given in icu either in hospital and wards the patient is in oxygen or oxygenation quarantined patients if suppose a patient has start getting uh, started getting uh, mild breathlessness even for those cases you have you may have to uh, uh, you may have to start uh, working as a physio for the improvement or to prevent the further damage as well even home visits also in a lot of countries other than this of course i know we have a lot of uh, students uh, other than uh, india and bangladesh who are in this uh, lecture who are attending the lecture so in a lot of countries home visits are also given to the recovered cases who are still on oxygenation and everything and there also a role of physiotherapist is important and you may also encounter it in future ahead opd basis of course the patient can come to you for pulmonary rehabilitation or the patient may also come to you after months for any other ailment so you need to really understand that this kind of condition will really be a person with an with a previous covid-19 will have will be having less strength and endurance as a person as compared to a person with a non covid condition like for example a basic back ache or a basic knee pain pain patient will also show different symptoms and different uh, recovery uh, levels and everything as compared to the patient who is in the no non covid stage and definitely post covid covid cases for rehabilitation so basically all these things you will be seeing when you are seeing any kind of icu uh, patient you really need to understand that what is your treatment protocol and how you have to uh, understand and go ahead with it basically one thing is sure that you cannot deny or you cannot escape from seeing a covid-19 patient today or in future because this disease is not going easily away so we have to be prepared being a physiotherapist to actually deal with all these conditions i have tried to cover the basic points whatever possible for you all to know at least to give you a basic image and understanding of what exactly you have to think while giving a, a, a proper treatment but there are a lot of other aspects like a proper protocol of the disease pulmonary rehabilitation there are different breathing exercises uh, there are different specific types of techniques where you can help the patient to breathe in facilitate breathing uh, even the assessment part a lot of practical part is also there because of the time limitation of course i cannot show you over there so usually i uh, conduct workshop on covid 19 for these things where you can actually learn all these things with practical and how to assess and decide where to give what treatment for that patient that is more in depth knowledge of these thing so you can follow me on any of these uh, social media uh, platforms facebook instagram or youtube where i keep on posting about the upcoming future uh, lectures and uh, you can uh, attend if interested so i hope you all understood about this and uh, is uh, if there is something that you want me to explain or anything you can ask you can ask your doubts that's the reason we have kept a good time for answering your doubts because i'm sure this is a new topic and it is not easy for everyone to suddenly especially for those who are really not working in icu or with test cases i don't we don't expect them to really immediately grasp it all and understand it it needs a lot of understanding so i am open to kind of questions yeah ma'am uh, now uh, our participant can ask question over here but already uh, two of them asked question like uh, dr md amran hosen mm -hmm. he has asked about the lower and peripheral opacity okay what about uh, what's the question exactly lower and peripheral opacity okay so what is the question how is it related to covid 19 yes he also knows about the lower and peripheral opacity how it works basically you calculate it with body mass index so any kind of opacity where the bmi goes above 40 is yeah it's not uh, obesity lung opacity okay okay lung opacities okay so can you just repeat the question i'm so sorry can you just repeat the question yes about you on your lecture you have mentioned there is a low in case of lower lobe there is a you will find that obesity 
class yes. type of book it's that's so, why he is yeah so basically sorry i'm so sorry i heard it wrong uh, so basically what happens is in any kind of lung like suppose uh, in any kind of covid 19 lungs the lower lobe is basically mostly affected okay and uh, if you have seen any case of normal pneumonia like a uh, non covid pneumonia usually we see consolidatory patches like consolidation patches or consolidation in those kind of but as this disease started progressing the researchers started finding that in covid conditions it was uh, the initially the initial patches were not like the proper consolidatory one so there were ground glass capacities that were found in pneumonia cases so basically when you have a consol like suppose just this is a balloon bladder i'll just give you the example if this is your pneumonia patch like suppose this is a consolidation so what happens is there is no gas exchange behind that consolidatory patch but in cases of ground glass opacity there is still some bronchovesicular markings and everything you can see and it is less severe as compared to consolidatory patch so that's why the progression is good and the recovery is good if the patient is getting recovered with that but as the disease progresses these ground glass opacities they get converted and they get changed into uh, you can say they get uh, aggregates into proper consolidation and then it goes ahead and becomes uh, goes into a respiratory failure so that's how it progresses ahead so i hope that's clear ma'am another question from uh, sneha shindhi that is strengthening can be started in the early phase a uh, so see first of all first thing before starting anything as i said that you have to take care that you are not doing anything that is increasing work of breathing in any kind of patient so starting strengthening in the earlier phase can be an option only if you have seen that your patient is uh, very much cooperative and your patient can tolerate it so anything that you do that uh, if you have to start uh, even the strengthening part of course not the proper resistance training and all that but definitely general mobility exercises and strengthening they it is it is given to cases who are in the icu in the early stage or in the weaning stage and everything but what you have to do is you have to really take uh, you have to really consider the uh, vital especially the oxygen saturation and you have to really consider whether the oxygen saturation is falling down with your exercise or not or whether you are doing any activity which can lead to or which is leading to increase uh, increased work of breathing in your patient so these are the things you have to take care uh, while or of course along with that blood pressure and heart rate should also be considered so all these things you have to consider if you want you can start that thing with your patient but keeping all these vitals into consideration and then gradually you can increase in your treatment okay but thank you ma'am is highly another question, yeah another question is from uh, prachi dubey the respiratory rate is rate is more decrease in icu patient then what should to do uh see now that depends on whether your patient is on uh, ventilator or whether your patient is on oxygen now to be very true as i said this condition shows a picture of mainly a lot of uh, this thing uh you can say uh, interstitial disease right so in the cases of interstitial diseases like you can just take a so common example of fibrosis okay usually of course the oxygen saturation decreases fine and even in some cases you as you said rr is decreased but usually with exercises rr increases i have seen more in most of the cases what we have seen but if that is happening again that means you have to be calculative while giving your exercise and keep that interstitial disease treatment treatment protocol in your mind now you know what happens what is the best part of such cases uh, to be uh, very true like even if we have uh, seen it from the researchers from the italian pulmonary rehab center and the uh, pulmonary rehab center from us as well uh, what happens is whenever you try to give any kind of uh, chest physiotherapy or pulmonary rehabilitation to the cases with fibrosis and interstitial disease if in covid cases what i'm trying to tell you that is what the pattern is uh, the patient's oxygen drops very easily it drops off very easily but immediately when you try to keep that patient uh, on a baseline given an interval to that patient and when you start the activity again then usually the patient is able to cope up with it so you may see this in such kind of case and this is something very normal with lung patients or any patients who are having any kind of restrictive lung disease 
So what you have to do is, if you do see any such thing, give a proper interval training to your patient. Let everything come to the baseline, and then you can restart your treatment. Don't think that you know that is a that there is a basic funda that you know when you are giving any treatment, you should not let all the vitals fall the baseline for the improvement. That doesn't work in this kind of condition. So that's how you can be calculative about your treatment part. Ma'am, another question from uh, Gofir Kurushi. That is, uh, he wants to know about the alveolar recruitment techniques. Okay, so as I said, I was talking about alveolar recruitment techniques. Basically, what uh, when we say that, that is mainly, uh, I was just talking about the breathing exercise that can help you to actually improve uh, the lung volumes. Now, what happens in these kind of condition is you have to really work on the inspiration and uh, chest expansion. Now. When I when I when I say interstitial disease, like basically it's a big huge topic. I'll just try to explain you. What happens is there is the reduction in the elasticity of the lung. So basically, you can say the lung is shrunken in size or fibrous or anything. Usually, ARDS leads to fibrosis of lungs as well. So what happens is in these conditions, you really need to work on such techniques that can help to increase the volume of the lung. So basically, when you work on lung volume recruitment techniques, that's what is included in alveolar recruitment techniques. So uh, the best exercise for these things are breath stacking exercise, breath hold exercise. Breath stacking exercise is one of the best exercise that you can do in this. And that's why I've given you that YouTube channel and the videos of that because it is included in that. So if you want to really recruit good lung volume in your patient, put your patients on good inspiratory holds as well as breath stacking technique. Basic diaphragmatic breathing exercise and all that with good number of holds. Patient won't be able to do that in the beginning, but of course, gradually you can treat your patients. You can help to improve their. Uh, you can facilitate their respiration with various other techniques, which are more practical, which I cannot tell you, uh, which I cannot just teach you because of this time limit. But that's how you go ahead with such kind of treatment. I hope it's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, Doctor Shashki Shashi Dotto. Uh, she has asked about the procedure of uh, prone positioning in case of ventilation. Okay, uh, so uh, I think I have showed you that initially in the image. If you have seen, so I have explained you like how you are, uh, like how you should place the post, uh, patient when the patient is on uh, when the pa when you have to take the pose uh, patient on prone positioning. Now, first thing, prone for prone positioning in ICU. You really need a good number of staff. If you think being a physiotherapist, you can just do it with one or two staff, then it is really not advisable. Because what happens is when the patient is in ARDS, any change in position can also change the vitals of the position. So it is not really advisable to really uh, to directly put the position for the first time on prone. So what you have to do is first put the patient on sideline, check the vitals, keep that patient in those that position for some time. And then we go on prone with minimum at least four to five minimum staff for the continuous assistance. And rest, I think in the uh, previous slides, I have shown you about uh, the uh, placement, how you put the patient along with the pillows in prone position so that you don't increase the work of breathing of these cases. Now, if you're putting a patient into prone position and if you think that patient is getting breathless, then immediately you will have to turn the patient because it is not necessary that even if the patient is having COVID-19 or if the patient is having ARDS, it is not necessary that they will tolerate prone positioning just because it is written in the research papers. So you have to really work on the vitals and see how it goes with it. I think it's um, Yes. Another question is if that aerosol generator procedure is not working, then any other procedure that a respiratory physiotherapist can do? Like a vibration, percussion, and tap, that is, uh, uh, your, voice is your voice is breaking a bit. Oh, okay, if if that aerosol generating procedure cannot be possible for any physio, then how he will or she will manage with other techniques? Okay, okay. see, uh, first of all, uh, I think she mentioned percussion, vibration, and all that, right? Yes, 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 ma'am. First of all, you need to understand that's what I said that cough is or secretion or mucus production is really not the common symptom in COVID-19. So basically, when you don't have that, you really don't need to go into that. Understood? You don't really don't need uh, any kind of uh, aerosol generating procedure when you really don't need to clear the lungs. 
more more than secretion production uh, the ventilation ventilation perfusion uh, mismatch and all that things are more important in treating any kind of covid 19 cases that's why we say positioning is important because ventilation is something that is affected more but still if you have any cases like if you get any patients where uh, you find secretions like as we saw 30% of cases may get it okay or if the patient is having any underlying condition like copd or anything which has given rise to any kind of secretions so in those cases uh, aerosol generating procedure is needed but then if you will see uh, the researchers and uh, in uk and all how they are practicing it they are using negative pressure room for and they are using a peri splint in line for such kind of nebulizers to give it to the patient so that the aerosol infection the droplet infection that occurs with that condition is reduced so there are other options as well which are being given to the patients wherever required other than that for physiotherapists percussion i will say is not a treatment of choice for covid 19 because the virus still we are learning about the virus so the multiplying nature of the virus mutating nature of the virus for that it's better and there are no researches which also support percussion so as such percussion is something i really don't advise for the patient only if it's like an extreme need for the patient other than that you think vibration if is if it is required for clearing the chin vibration can be given along with postural drainage but you have to really take care of the peep on which the patient is there if the patient is on ventilation and also you have to see that whether your technique is not dropping the oxygen continuously for a longer duration so these two things you have to consider as i said in the previous slide the physiotherapist has to be uh, have to be very much smart and uh, logical while deciding the treatment so that's how you need to understand how it goes okay ma'am another question is uh, yes ma'am uh, thank you ma'am uh, another question is from your uh, student devesh sarkar he is asked about oh. the what is covid 2 what okay uh, so yeah COVID i think two. i have student attended by <laughs> okay okay yes. there are students who attended workshop as well and that's really so nice of them to really listen about the topic once again and that also in a shorter form so yes covid 2 as i said okay i don't have a picture of it suppose this is my toe like i can just explain you this so if you can see the border this is a finger of course imagine this is a toe so usually there is a, there was rashes which were found around the border of these toes in kids children or uh, in uh, peds uh, pediatric cases so initially when this disease started it was a symptom which was found in the uh, case in such cases and then later it uh, for patients who were affected with covid 19 and then later it was found uh, that this was just a generally a general rash uh, in fact you can say general skin rash or allergic reaction which usually children get because of any kind of viral infection the only difference was that that in covid cases they started finding it near the toes and that's why that thing was termed as covid toes but it is very much treatable and uh, it is uh, reversible as well uh, it, it it is uh, it, the recovery rate is really good in this so i hope it's clear yeah yes ma'am thank you ma'am uh, another question from uh, ramesh takula about the 6 minutes walk test for covid patient okay. if there is a 98 to 90% uh, saturation level of oxygen see frankly speaking a uh, 6 minute walk test is a good way to actually assess the functional capacity of your patient it is a kind of submaximal exercise testing which can be given when you are planning to rehabilitate your patient so it like to start the rehabilitation of your patient but frankly speaking i really don't give 6 minute walk test to my patients what i have shown you was from the international papers but there is something other than 6 minute walk test which is called as 4 minute walk test as well 2 minute walk test as well other than that you have sit to stand test there are a lot of other tests which you can give to your patients sit to stand test then tug test so it is not necessary to just go for one kind of sub maximal exercise testing if you have a good amount prepare like if you have a good uh, you can say a 100 meter foot hop necessary precautions and arrangements then you can go for 6 minute walk test as well 
but for the person who is having saturation of 90 to 92 i would suggest either just a 2 minute walk test or better than that i would suggest sit to stand walk test uh, that is again another kind of walk test which you can uh, correlate like which can help you to actually know the functional capacity of your patient so that's all all these things all the methods and everything i teach in my workshop with practicals to make it more easier for the students so yeah i hope it's clear like at least this much you can understand the yeah. yes ma'am ma'am today already our time is uh, very short now already uh, it's close to 10 oh, voice so, is uh, maybe yeah uh, ma'am uh, our time is, is close to 10. okay ma'am time is not uh, i think uh, time is close to 10 now so we have to stop for today so in another session you, or in your uh, hello okay ma'am hello ma'am uh, dr shanti can can't hear you yeah no, uh, now it's clear ma'am i can't hear you uh yeah come again yeah ma'am now clear ma'am can you hear me ma'am hello can you hear me ma'am yeah ma okay. okay yes ma'am ma today already we, we are okay. close to 10 now so we have to stop for today maybe uh, next any other days we can uh, again we can talk and i think uh, thanks ma'am for your nice uh, presentation and lecture i think uh, people can learn lot more better or lot more more things in your uh, workshop and that will be 4 hours so it's only 45 minutes or uh, on our so already we have crossed our limit so i think uh, next a lot of question are there but still we have a plan for next future and thank you ma'am and thank you for thank you. Uh, give us uh, uh, that opportunity and uh, uh, that is uh, humbly take our invitation and uh, i think uh, we can uh, go further and uh, next time we will uh, can join again with any other issues on respiratory condition and thanks all participants uh, uh, we are sorry for the time duration i think we have to uh, go for another uh, program so thank you very much and thank you ma'am so we will thank share you, your any yes ma'am your next anything uh, on your next workshop or any any kind of news from you will share on our pages so please follow our thank page you. and yeah keep on touch with our page and then you can see lot of more things and everything from uh, what we ma'am will provide so we'll easily telecast or broadcast or share thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank so thank you. much thank you everyone and uh, take care be safe that's all take care thank, thank you. you thank you जतटुक समय कथा बोलते चेलम तरह अनेक बस समय अनेक कि शेखा छो अने परिष्कार जाना दरकार छो सब मानते चेष्टा कर आयोजन करते अथवा से तीन थे चार घंटा एवं छुट्टी दिन से व्यवस्था करब एवं अवश्य से गुते किनारियम व्यवस्था थकते तो बेपारे अपने मतमत भित्ती सहयोगित नहीं भविष्य सेफर्म करब एवं अपन परिशेषे बोलो जो आज के परीक्षा आज के जो प्रेजेंटेशन थे जो ज्ञान अर्जन करवश्य अपनारा से प्रैक्टिकाली कर आगे सवार माध्यम का प्रचार कर शेयर करमेंट कर लाइक दीबें और पेजर सब समय जुक्त थकें तो आज के पर्यत धन्यवाद सबा के